Okay, I think uh, we are again ready to go. Hello everyone and welcome again to another Saturday microscopy live stream. Um, yeah, I'm just checking now if everything works uh, from uh, the sound aspect and everything. Yeah, I think it should work. I'm simply checking now. Okay, yes, I can see myself uh, now also in the video. I'm checking in my browser. Okay, so here we're ready to go. Um, I want to wish you a nice day again. Um, just let me quickly uh, view this here a little bit. I have a, a simple, I'm not seeing my, um, my the, the, the chat uh, yet. Just a second. Custom browser docs apply. Okay. For whatever reason, I'm, I'm not able to see my chat uh, box here. Just a second, give me a few minutes here. Multi view, view screen, reset user interface. Just a second. Um, no, okay. Well, I guess I have to improvise. It's a little bit strange. Usually I'm able to see what the people are, um, uh, are typing in on the side. And uh, YouTube chat. No, that's also not the thing that I want to do. It's kind of weird. Dog long reset dogs. Um, reset the UI. Okay, guys, um, I'm just uh, still playing around here. Just be a little bit patient. Otherwise, I'm going to simply uh, see what people are typing in directly into the um, into the chat box uh, in the YouTube video. But that's still YouTube chat chat. Yes, here it is. Haha, <laughs> I got it. Good. I had a problem with the finding it in the menu. Um, just a second, maybe I'm able to dock it somehow here at the top. Okay, well. Okay, uh, the sound is low, um, audio quality low. I'm going to go up a little bit. Is it now better? I hope it's, uh, I went up a little bit with the sound. Uh, sound. Uh, um, yeah, with the loudness, I hope that it's better right now. Okay, well, um, yeah, I think I hope I've got everything set up. Uh, I hope that everyone is able to hear me. And uh, yeah, wow, yes, better. Yes, so uh, I already got a lot of questions here um, and uh, many greetings from all over the world. I'm see, I usually do this at the beginning because I really like it. There are so many people joining in from all over the place. Uh, greetings from Bulgaria, um, from Serbia. Wow, from Austria. Yes, well, I have to say greetings uh, from Upper Austria. I'm streaming from Upper Austria near Linz. Um, hello to Robert. Um, and uh, then I think uh, we're ready to go now. Okay, so um, look what I prepared uh, for today. Um, a, a whole range of uh, questions that I've got here. Uh, this does not mean that uh, we have to cover all of those questions um, or that I have to answer all of them. Um, of course, uh, many of you are going to post questions also in the chat. And uh, we're just going to take it from there. The questions are all over the place. Okay, so there are some hardware related questions. There are some, some opinion questions from myself. Um, I'll, maybe I'm going to demonstrate to you how I clean an objective. It, they're all over the place, the questions. And I'm quite uh, sure that uh, you're also going to be asking uh, questions in the chat here. Okay, hello from Michigan and also from Germany. <laughs> I love this. So I don't even know where to start. Um, um, but um, what I decided, because this has been actually a request uh, by many people, is, is how do you clean? Um, how do you clean the objectives? Okay, and uh, what is the possibility of cleaning the objectives? And what I have here is, is very briefly, I've got a, a pretty bad looking objective. Okay, um, this objective over here, um, I've got from one of the microscopes uh, from our school. I'm a teacher, and uh, the students complained because they could not see anything at all. And uh, I checked and of course it was not the focus uh, or problem, usually that's the case. But when I looked um, at uh, the bottom, I took it out, I, I could see that there was some glue, some mounting medium or maybe some solidified uh, immersion oil even. Okay, um, not good. Um, so I took it out and what uh, you do normally to check if the um, if it's really dirty or not, is, is you uh, look at uh, through the uh, yeah the objective from behind. And I'm not able, yeah, maybe if I have something here which is a little bit more contrasty, okay, to see this. It's not only dirty, but there is even a small crack there. I don't know if you're able to see this, okay. 
um, the condition is uh, pretty bad so even cleaning will not uh, help but I'm using this uh, objective in any case to do a little cleaning demonstration. Now um, generally how often should you clean an objective? Well ideally almost never because there is no reason to clean it unless you have an oil immersion objective where you just want to wipe off uh, the immersion oil. Um, but otherwise there is no real reason to clean the objective unless of course uh, you accidentally dump it uh, in, into maybe some mounting medium or so. And in this case, of course, you have to use some solvent. Now the problem with uh, objectives is that there is a real danger for the cleaning solution and I'm going to use uh, alcohol um, to run into the, you know, the cracks here. And that's obviously not good, okay? Um, you do not want to use any uh, solvent uh, for cleaning eyeglasses, okay? That's not uh, necessary, no, it's not good because there's some, some, some additional substances in there. And um, yeah, um, so you want to use a solution which is highly volatile, which evaporates quickly. And uh, normally you have to use a solution which is recommended by the manufacturer. And uh, what I have used for many, you, yeah, for some time is, is a mixture of uh, alcohol and ether. 70% um, ether and 30% alcohol is very uh, volatile. This here is uh, just a pure alcohol um, solution so that you are able to see how how this works, but actually, yeah, you probably want to use an alcohol ether solution, but I've heard that many people are using um, just alcohol. Yeah. And what you do is you do the following. You put it on here like this. Um, this is, uh, yeah, lens cleaning tissue paper. Yeah, uh, you put a drop over here, okay, and you pull it over and that's it, okay? This is how you clean, uh, uh, no pressure at all. And if there are any, um, yeah, dust grains on the lens, then they're not going to be pressed in into the glass and any um, solvents that might be on the, um, yeah, on the objective, because as I mentioned, some mounting medium, <laughs> Yeah, um, could have uh, yeah contacted the, the the lens. Well, then this will also be uh, will be um, also removed. Okay, um, that's uh, the way you clean it. Um, I did not invent this. Uh, this is actually <laughs> I got this also from um, from other YouTube videos uh, from companies uh, that actually demonstrate this uh, how to do this. Yeah, and um, of course, if you have if this were an oil immersion objective, then of course what you do is you lightly wipe off uh, the immersion oil. The front lens usually is um, yeah concave, so it means it actually goes inwards. So this means that uh, there is uh, sometimes if there is some uh, material inside uh, directly on the lens. It shouldn't be, but it can happen. Then sometimes, um, yeah, you have to actually um, do try to apply a little bit of pressure to actually get it out. Um, and uh, maybe I think I already mentioned this last in my last video. I talked to a representative of uh, the Olympus company who basically, because I've got an Olympus microscope, I asked him how to clean the objectives. And he recommended that, or he said that some people are actually quite, they're too, too careful. So those objectives are actually able to withstand more than you might think. And he actually recommended that if there is indeed some dirt in there, that you actually um, really go in with a tissue paper, of course, with the fingernail and actually carefully um, scratch it out. Okay. And he said that, uh, yeah, uh, this actually the, in most objectives so will, won't have a problem with that. Yeah? Otherwise, you're not able to get the dirt out. Yeah? So what I would probably say is, is maybe you make some kind of a, a for really difficult dirt, maybe you, you twist it around a little bit and you try to um, get it out like this. Yeah? Um, but again, um, only necessary if it's uh, really dirty. Okay, So this is uh, simply something that I quickly wanted to demonstrate because uh, some people were asking. Okay, so And then what I'm going to do first is I'm going to first answer the questions uh, that uh, were posted in the chat very briefly. And uh, then I'll yeah, go back to uh, some of my questions. So uh, one of the questions here at the very beginning um, by uh, Thoughts Bright uh, posted the question, can we see cells or bacteria or organelles cells or bacteria or, or cell organelles by staining them if they're too small to use a 6,000 times magnification technique with a really strong light. I need to explain this. Some months ago, maybe even a few years ago, I made a video in this channel where I wanted to demonstrate that if you go up with a magnification that this does not automatically, that you, you, won't, you, will, you will not be able to see more automatically and I actually magnified it up 
to 6,000 times by adding very cheap Barlow lenses. Barlow lenses are lenses that you can add um, yeah, in front of the eyepiece. I'm, I'm just gonna show this to you over here. Uh, I don't have a Barlow lens now with me, um, but um, essentially what you can do is you can add some lenses, concave lenses um, uh, in here, and then you put the eyepiece in and this increases the magnification. And I've been doing this and I got a magnification of, of I don't know, 4,000 or 6,000 times this way. It was completely blurry, completely useless, but I simply wanted to demonstrate uh, this that, um, yeah, you can magnify up to whatever you want, but it doesn't mean that you're going to see much more, right? And now the question here is, is, is um, if you were to magnify that much, but if you actually do um, some proper specimen preparation, okay, but some staining, are you going to be able to see them? And the answer is no. Um, it's not going to be better because there is a physical limit of what light is able to resolve. It's not a question of specimen preparation. There is um, a so-called Abe's law. Um, Ernst Abe, he was a, yeah, a, yeah, a physicist, optician, yeah, um, uh, worked with uh, the Zeiss company back in the 19th century. And um, it, there is a certain limit of resolution uh, of clarity that you can obtain. And uh, I just want to illustrate this to you a little bit by using um, an analogy here, by using um, my hand here and, as, an, yeah, as an object. And uh, let's say that this pen over here were the light. And uh, this is the specimen. And you know, if uh, I'm able to use the pen and I'm able to move over the fingers, I'm able to actually sense that they're, yeah, the shape of my hand, okay, by, by passing over my fingers because the pen, the light, um, is uh, finer uh, than the object that I'm sampling, okay? So I'm able to actually determine the shape of the object by, by passing a pen over my hand, okay? Um, but what happens now if the, yeah, if I'm not going to use a pen, but if I'm going to use a thick flashlight, okay, then I'm not able uh, to sense all of the details. Yeah? And it doesn't matter what I do uh, with the specimen preparation of my hand. If the, the, the light it does not, is not able to resolve it, then I'm not able to gain uh, the details. And so for this reason, um, there is a limit um, in a magnification, um, which is approximately 1000 times. And everything that goes beyond that, uh, we microscopists refer to as so-called empty magnification, it means a magnification without information. Yeah? So um, I have to unfortunately say that uh, the question is, is uh, yeah, by, uh, by staining them or using more light is not going to help. The thing that the only thing that I can do is, is can, I can use maybe more blue light, which has a shorter wavelength, with, which does improve the resolution. But at this point, I also have to say that uh, in the year 2014, a um, yeah, team of scientists, uh, Stefan Hell, he was a German um, uh, researcher, he got the Nobel Prize uh, because he was able to use a trick um, in microscopy to actually resolve structures that are smaller than the resolution limit. The resolution limit still applied, but by, by using fluorescent microscopy and a couple of, of fluorescent labeling, he was able to go around this Abe limit. Um, and uh, that's basically why he got the Nobel Prize. But still, the law uh, applies and he simply was able to bypass the law. Okay. So, yes, uh, there are um, a couple of uh, yes, hello from Michigan, from Germany, from Scotland. Hello, hello from uh, from India. Hello back. Can you st still say uh, can you stain cells or bacterial? Um, yes, uh, it is possible to stain cells and bacteria. Um, but I would say um, I don't have the equipment here right now. Um, but uh, this is indeed possible, and uh, there are many different stains stains around. Hello from Spain. If money were no problem, would uh, you like to do fluorescence. Um, why not? The reason why I'm not doing fluorescent micro... Well, actually, <laughs> okay. Uh, fluorescent microscopy, let me start at the beginning, uses ultraviolet light or uh, blue light uh, to uh, make uh, certain structures shine on the back, black background. It's, um, of course, it's a money issue. Um, however, it is possible to do so-called blue light excitation uh, microscopy where you're using blue light LEDs and I'm currently yeah I've been uh, experimenting around a little bit with that um, so so where you're able to make uh, the chloroplasts of plants for example shine up red this is possible um, so it, it's not even a money question um, but um, fluorescent microscopy um, actually if I were to dig into that to really get the benefit I'd have to do a labeling um, of the specimens with fluorescent antibodies. 
and I need a lab for this and I need a lot of time for this. And this is therefore something I'm not going to get involved in uh, because it's also, I would say, too advanced for the yeah, average hobby microscopist. And my YouTube channel here actually is also targeted to hobbyists and to uh, educators and, and also to, to, um, yeah, to people who are basically want to do nature observation. And fluorescent microscopy, if I were to do it in, in a very intensive way, actually does require quite a bit of lab work and quite a bit of specimen preparation. Yeah? So, okay, again, uh, hello from Spain. If they're too small, um, can you use the 6,000 times technique and stain them or make them reflective using dark field with strong light? Okay, um, is it possible? Dark field is an interesting thing. Um, dark field microscopy um, uses, I have got over here, a so-called a dark field filter. It is a 3D printed one, okay? And um, basically you can also make, some people make them using cardboard. Yeah, they're, it's really cheap um, to make. And you put the dark field filter into um, the filter holder. So I have got a filter holder over here. Okay, and you put the dark field filter in here. Now you're gonna see, oh, it's not gonna fit. It doesn't fit. The reason is, is because I made this dark field filter for different microscope, okay? But you can put it in here into the filter holder. And then what you're going to see is, is you're going to see now the specimen bright on a dark background. And here we have an interesting thing. With dark field microscopy, you are able to see structures that are smaller than the resolution limit. However, okay, so yes, you are able to see smaller structures because they start to shine up bright on a dark background. However, and it's a big however, you're not going to see any structural details. You're just going to see a diffraction pattern. So um, you're just gonna see a fuzzy spot. And the fuzzy spot is, let's say, this big, bright, even though the structure itself that you're able to see is actually that small, okay? So it is like this, if some of you are, for example, um, like I am, short-sighted and you need glasses, and at night, when you're looking at a lamp, then you're going to see that the lamp is much fuzzier and blurrier and larger than it actually is. And uh, the same thing is with dark field microscopy. So while you are able to see structures that are smaller than the resolution limit, um, you will not see any structural details because it's a fuzzy, a fuzzy spot, okay? So that's a little bit, um, uh, the answer is a little bit of a yes or no. Um, uh, it has both yes or no, um, yeah, yeah, a yes or no answer, okay? Um, can you tell us how to make plant stem permanent slides at home? That is possible. Um, you have to microtome them. Um, you have to dehydrate them. But that's actually a good recommendation here. And you know what? Um, why not? Okay, uh, not right now because I actually I did not prepare this. Um, but this is actually indeed making permanent slides of uh, plant stems cross sections using either hand cuts or microtome cuts is a possibility. Okay. Using a stereo microscope, what is it better to use a 10 times eyepiece or a 4 times objective lens or a 20 times eyepiece and a 2 times objective, both are giving 40 times magnification? So also a very interesting and important question. Generally, I would say with stereo microscopes, the issue is not so big. But um, with compound microscopes, the answer is very clear. And I would say, therefore, let's use the same system also for stereo microscopes. Um, you can get the same magnification by multiplying the, i just show you again over here, you can get the same magnification by multiplying the uh, objective by the eyepiece, okay? So four times uh, 10 is 40 times. Now what happens if I use a lower magnification eyepiece um, and um, Oh, other way around, a higher magnification eyepiece and a lower magnification objective. You will get the same uh, magnification, but it's going to be more blurry. Okay, very, very clear answer. Yeah? Probably you're not going to see a huge difference with stereo microscopes because stereo microscopes still operate quite much below the resolution limit. With the compound microscopes, you're already approaching the resolution limit. Okay, so my general suggestion is, um, let's apply the same system, high magnification of the objective, low magnification of the eyepiece. Okay, um, you can use uh, acridine orange for nuclei or Janus green for mitochondria. Acridine orange is, I think, cancer causing. 
okay um so uh, be careful with this i mean i remember that i've been staining myself um in the lab when i was still at university with acrid and orange i don't know Janus green Janus green uh, but be careful with some of the stains because stains that stain nuclei it's the nucleus of the cell the nucleus contains dna and some of those stains what they do is they will so-called intercalate within the dna intercalate means that the, the the stain will actually go into the dna the bases of the dna are stacked top of each other and the, the and those um, stains will go into the dna and it, they will start to fluorescence when you put a uv light on it for example but the problem is, is if you have stains that interact with the dna um, then they will of course also interact with the human dna if i spill some of the stain on my skin and then this uh, can actually cause dna damage and uh, this is risky okay um yes uh, from, uh, uh hello from from sweden here and um, um, as, as well okay so um okay um there have been a few questions um yeah and yes and they definitely need special handling and hazardous waste disposal yes thank you probably not good at home needs gloves yes and i remember that when i uh, um, stained using acridine orange then i used actually double gloves okay what's the most interesting thing about microscope how did you get into the passion well, this is a general question, but it's, I think, really important. Okay, so I'm going to, can you, could you increase the volume, please? Okay, I'll go up a little bit with the volume again. So, um, yeah, how did I get into microscopy? Um, for me, um, microscopy is uh, both a very important hobby. Um, I like making YouTube videos, obviously but um, I'm also using microscopy as a biology teacher because I'm instructing my students. I got into microscopy when I got my first uh, toy microscope when I was six years old. Um, then there was a long time nothing, uh, just a high degree of interest, uh, but actually no active microscopy until I went to university and studied microbiology. And there I used microscopes um, and I was actually a little bit, I'll be honest, I was a little bit disappointed because uh, I studied microbiology in connection with molecular biology because microscopes were not really used that often. Um, because I did mostly uh, DNA work. Um, yeah, and uh, microscopes were used for quality control to sometimes check um, whether you've actually got the still E. coli. Are you still working with E. coli or do you have some kind of a, a contaminant? Um, and I did a little bit of um, also during my master thesis, I worked also with uh, systematic bacteriology. So I used microscopes to characterize bacteria, but um, I did not really look at the interesting things. No, I wouldn't say interesting, that's the wrong word, the fun things. Fun things to look at are the ciliates, is water life, the big, the big microscopic organisms. There is simply more to see um, and they're more interesting to look at. So this was actually something that I did not really get um, a lot involved here. And um, until I decided to buy myself a microscope at the end of my university studies. And as I said, I want to have a really good one. And I bought my first microscope back in 1998. So this is already over 25 years ago. Um, and I said, I want to really get a good one. And at that time, the low cost Chinese microscopes that you have nowadays didn't exist yet. So I actually had to buy myself a, a, a microscope that was quite decent was an Olympus, uh, Nikon would have also been a possibility, Leica, Zeiss as well, of course, they're more expensive. Um, but um, I got myself a, a decent uh, uh, microscope, doctor's microscope, as they called it. And this is how I started. And uh, as a matter of fact, my first videos that I made in my Micro Hunter channel still are using, I made with this microscope and I still you have it and I still use it, okay? So um, this is uh, basically how I got into this. And then only when I started actually making uh, uh, YouTube videos, this is when I was at, there was a real incentive to really pick up microscopy more and to really think um, about objects that I actually want to put under the microscope for the viewers, okay? And that's kind of where we are right now, okay? So, um, so no discernible increase in volume, also a bit muffled, sorry. Okay, so, me, me, hmm, okay. I don't know how what to do with the sound, honestly, because I did not change much around. I hope that I'm still able, that you're still able to hear me properly. Yeah. So um, I'm going to move on a little bit with some of those questions. I already see that uh, I'm not able to yeah, um, answer um, all of them. But there was a question in my last stream 
um, in, the, in my last stream that uh, I said is I w w was not able to answer because of lack of time. Um, and what different types of microscope objectives are there? This is a long and extensive question and I made some time ago um, also a longer video in this channel referring to microscope ob about microscope objectives, but I simply want to quickly mention this um, briefly. The microscope objectives that you get when you buy yourself a, a normal microscope, a low cost microscope, let's say from Amazon, are so-called achromatic objectives. These are the standard objectives like, like I have over here. And uh, it says here acro. Yeah, some, sometimes it's, uh, it doesn't say anything. And um, these objectives um, essentially um, are the most economical ones. And they would, I would say they would, they're, they're fine for 90%. 80, 90, 95% of the cases. Um, they're used extensively in routine, um, yeah, in routine observations. Hobbyists, almost all of them have those. Um, but um, if you want to do photography, uh, certain specimens um, will um, have so-called uh, chromatic aberration. And this basically means color fringes. So um, yeah, if you were to observe something, if there's a black and a white high contrast, then there is uh, some rainbow colors. Some one edge is a little bit purple, and then the other edge is a little bit yellowish. Um, unless you're, let's put it this way: um, if you're not looking for it, a normal beginner who doesn't know about this will will not recognize this or not see this as an issue. But people who are into photography, um, actually, for them, it's con they will consider this disturbing. And um, therefore, therefore, there are other objectives around that corrected, and these are called so-called apochromatic objectives, APOs, APOs, and they are manufactured only by big companies. Um, they are significantly more expensive, um, and uh, they um, also produce a sharper image, and are used, of course, in research. Uh, because uh, for some research specimens, you need a very big, very intensive clarity, okay? And those apochromatic objectives, um, because they're more corrected, um, will produce a more clear image. However, um, you can only get the benefit of those uh, objectives if the specimen is properly prepared. Um, and um, in some cases, uh, it's like this, that uh, also the so-called the working distance, which is the distance between the slide and the objective is significantly smaller with those apochromatic objectives, which is already again a disadvantage. Yeah? And then there are also so-called fluoride objectives, and those fluoride objectives are known as so-called semi-apochromatic objectives, which are somewhere in between. They're a little bit less expensive than the, than the apochromatic objectives. Yeah? So you see, um, there is a whole range of them. I would say for a normal hobbyist, this might not be relevant, um, as those objectives are also, the, the higher-end objectives are actually only made by, by the bigger companies. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. But one more question, please. I'm really interested in microscopy, but I'm young, 14 to 16. How do I start with what microscope? Thank you for the question. It's a common question and I give you my opinion now. Not only that, I will tell you the different views and opinions that there are. And let me move over, over because I'm almost disappearing here on the side. Um, there are different views and opinions on how to start uh, microscopy and I will simply outline them to you. And um, then I'll take you my, uh, my view. Um, there are, p if you read the forums, online forums, um, then um, you, you have a whole range of different views. And there is one view uh, where people say, is, well, don't um, yeah, save yourself uh, some money together, buy yourself a good microscope and um, it's better to buy yourself a used microscope, uh, which has been refurbished because they are of high quality. Th that is version one. Okay, go for brand microscopes, invest a little bit more, and because new brand microscopes are too expensive, get a used brand microscope from the 1980s, um, which has been refurbished. This is version number one. Okay, version number two is the version is the following is as well. Uh, buying used microscopes is a problem. You have to know already a little bit about microscopy. It's a question of luck. Um, you don't whether the microscope is actually good because you have often no warranty, no guarantee, and so on. So you cannot send it back so easily. Sometimes the used microscopes are equipped with objectives that are not suitable. Maybe they're very expensive and special purpose objectives, and the person who sells it to you doesn't know. Therefore, the view is is buy yourself a 
um, yeah, um, a, a reasonably cheap microscope for let's say 300 to 400 dollars or euros um, and uh, then that's the thing that you should start off with okay that's version number two um, version number um, three is in, yeah is the following is is and that's I would say probably my version is 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 don't spend too much at the beginning at all um, calculate a hun around a hundred hundred twenty dollars or euros and if you're a complete beginner then buy yourself um, not a toy microscope I think uh, that's something that uh, pretty much all people agree but some kind of an introductory microscope okay those introductory microscopes they do not have a condenser down here um, they only have one eyepiece to look through they um, have the maximum of 40 times 10 is 400 times magnification and get started with that okay why because the entry barrier is financially so low and they are still good enough that you can actually do serious hobby microscopy okay now you're going to outgrow the microscope if you stick with the hobby you're going to outgrow the microscope probably in a couple of months and you want to have more but I say that the more expensive microscopes sometimes are so much more expensive already um, that um, the initial investment really doesn't make a huge difference so especially if you're um, yeah if you're young you don't have uh, a lot of budget but you want to get uh, started with uh, nature observation get one of those use your mobile phone to take pictures and I guarantee you that um, yeah you'll be part of the the community you can post the pictures online on reddit and you can uh, find all find all, this, all of the things that you want to see not maybe not in the quality that more expensive microscopes have you cannot do some of the things like for example dark field is not possible okay you do not have a condenser where you can control contrast and depth of field so there are certain limitations however um, I would say that the entry barrier therefore is so low that I would say just start with a low-cost microscope use it for learning and then make a decision later on in which direction you want to go okay that's my uh, general recommendation yeah okay it becomes an issue for uh, colocalization when doing quantitative microscopy is it an achievable project to live live stream a micro aquatic environment I want to live stream uh, smallish organisms such as ostracods water fleas what setup would you recommend I tried this I tried uh, some several months ago a live stream um, directly um, under um, where I connected one of my microscopes and may maybe I don't know if it's still online or whether I took it down so I, for a few hours um, um, I, I live streamed something and the problem with that was is that um, essentially the water always started to evaporate and um, there's not always sometimes uh, if there are no interesting objects uh, visible then of course this might be an issue okay what I would recommend is uh, in this case uh, use a so-called a water immersion microscope uh, objective um, there are certain objectives that can be actually immersed directly into water okay so they're kind of like uh, surrounded by water yeah these are called water immersion objectives and and then you have enough water um, there uh, so that um, yeah you're able to live stream this however um, I would probably say is maybe if you want to um, uh, live stream something like this use probably stereo microscopes because they have a larger depth of field it is not so um, yeah it do doesn't magnify too much and you can see uh, you have a larger field of view okay so especially if you want to I don't know some some uh, water fleas or worms I would say that probably uh, stereo microscopes are better yeah um, so should I buy Swift okay um, honestly the, the question about the Swift microscopes um, look they're also similar they belong to the same category yeah I would say um, it's almost a question of taste yeah and I think um, uh, I looked at both of them they're quite similar yeah um, can you put a homemade a dark field microscope into an introductory microscope believe it or not this is one of the questions here okay what a coincidence yeah can you do dark field microscopy with introductory microscopes and the answer is no okay and this is what I want to explain here um, what you need in order to do dark field microscopy you need a proper condenser and those filter wheels you can forget there are I would say they're not effective at all okay uh, what you need is, is you need a condenser and a condenser looks like this okay so a condenser has a, a, a diaphragm 
okay, that you can open and close, which is uh, used to control depth of field and contrast, and a filter holder. Now, this one is a pop-on filter holder, but many microscopes have a so-called swing-out filter holder. Okay, and then in, into this filter holder, you put, um, yeah, you have got a blue filter because it's uh, designed for halogen lamp, uh, but and then you put a dark field filter in here, um, and uh, yeah, then you put it on here, um, and then you can do dark field microscopy. So your microscope needs to have a condenser, and uh, introductory microscopes don't have one, therefore it's not uh, possible. Okay, um, you can try the following: you can try to shine light from the top. Okay, okay, using a flashlight. Um, and then, um, of course, the background is also going to be darker. So this would be actually something that I would recommend. Get yourself a, a strong flashlight, shine it from the top, and you also have, uh, yeah, get, make, the, make sure that the background is dark. And then you can also see that uh, some objects will appear bright on a dark background. It's not true dark field microscopy, uh, but it might actually also work. Okay. Um, I can just look experiments online if I just want the information, not the process of microscoping. Okay, this is very specific questions. Pyrimidine and, uh, is a reactive use in some protocol uh, impregnation staining cells. You know, another less toxic substance as no. Um, this is a very specific question, um, and I won't be able to, unfortunately, not able to answer this out of the top of my head. Yeah, what's the, exactly the purpose of a blue filter? Yes. Okay, so this here is a blue filter. Some microscopes actually come with one a separate one equipped. And this actually is, in my view, uh, primarily useful if you are using microscopes with a halogen lamp. Many uh, microscopes these days have a LEDs and I'm always surprised that they still come with a blue filter. Okay, um, halogen lamps have a much more redder color uh, yeah, they're more the, the, the long uh, the wavelength is more pronounced. Um, and also the halogens, if you change the intensity, the brightness, then you're also changing the color temperature. So if you're at the low setting, the, uh, the LED, the, 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 the halogens are more red and at the bright settings, they're more blue. And the, the, the blue um, filter gives it a more balanced color. Okay, so, uh, so the image doesn't quite look quite as red if you're using halogen. Yeah? And it also filters away some of the infrared um, heat radiation as well. So primarily used for halogen lamps. I don't know why um, microscopes these days with LEDs also come with those. Okay. Uh, why can't I just look at photos or videos in the internet instead of microscoping myself? This is a, a common uh, question and um, um, a, a question that uh, um, basically I've also asked one of my former students who's studying medicine. And the answer is the following. Um, these days, indeed, this is called virtual microscopy and is indeed uh, becoming popular where um, companies and universities and, uh, uh, yeah, and also hospitals, what they're doing is, is they're scanning a slide, they're making a microscope slide, okay? They're scanning the slides um, and then um, uh, they are making the file available online at a very high resolution and uh, where you can even zoom in and then maybe several people are able to look at it. So number one, yes, this is already done. The interesting question now is, is if it's already technically possible to go completely virtual, okay, completely digital, why is this then not a general thing that is done? And the reason is the following is because by looking through a microscope, um, you have, it's still from an, it's difficult for me to put in words, from an emotional aspect, it's something different. You're much more closely connected. It's a little bit like asking as an analogy, why, why, why visit different countries if I can watch videos and pictures about those countries? You see, um, uh, yeah, the information that you might get is the same, you know, um, I, I agree. I mean, if you go virtual microscopy, you, you see the picture with all of the labels already added. You can do all of the measurements online uh, directly on, on screen. You can have uh, labels and, and pop up windows and, and, and you, it's, it's really cool. Right. So from an information aspect, it has many advantages, but um, it's something. And when I asked my the med student, a former student of mine, says, why are you guys actually still doing microscopy courses if you can go on? And she says, yeah, it's different. It's different when you actually sit behind a microscope and when you directly interact with it. And there is another technical reason that I just want to mention here, something that I have not seen yet, 
yet with virtual uh, di uh, mic mic microscopy where you see the pictures and that's the ability to focus okay so with static images um, yeah you still have one plane you cannot focus and another thing is the following is when i want to do nature exploration directly okay um then uh, i I'm, i just want to see what can i find now in this specific sample okay um and then um yeah i i need a microscope directly if i just want to see okay what how do paramecia look like more generally of course then i can use um pictures and this is actually also done okay so this is um yeah um, um yeah Please, energy B question above. I don't. I'm. I'm not quest, quite sure now which one is it. Yeah. Um, do you have any recommend microscope for polish section? Okay. I think what you're referring to is is now when you're polishing minerals and rocks, and if you want, if this is what you mean, um, uh, my, microscopy for polishing. Um, uh, minerals and rocks because you have to polish them down to make them very thin then I can very clearly say yeah uh, these are called the so-called um, uh, uh, polarizing microscopes because uh, many rocks and minerals that are polished down uh, the crystals are polarizing and then you want to have a polarizing microscope yeah? um, and uh, yeah uh, there's a polarizer and an analyzer and you can also rotate the stage simply for experimental polarization work you can actually make it yourself you just put a polarizer two polarizing filters between this, the rock sections uh, but if you want to really uh, make measurements and so on then you need a polarization microscope okay um, do you uh, considering to write some book title key for identification of object organism under the microscope do you have a very a great sense to identify I don't know about what kind of book guide on market you know what uh, I think I'm going to make a separate uh, video on this um, there first of all um, there is a book that I recommend um, it's called it's in German however however it doesn't matter because the drawings um, yeah are in there and uh, yeah it's called uh, the life in a drop of water um, and uh, uh, the thing is what I, I I always use this just a second give me one second maybe I've got the book here Okay, here it is. This is the old edition, okay? Um, the new edition is, is white. This is an identification book that I use. It is in German, but even if you do not speak German, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, for copyright reasons, I cannot show you a lot, okay? Uh, but maybe very far away, okay? There are pictures in here, okay? Um, and uh, descriptions on, on the other side. And um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good one, um, I would say. Um, the descriptions are not so important because once you've got the name, you can type in the name into Google and then you can find out more about the organism. Yeah? So it's, it's really that you have something to, 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 to look at and then you know the name. And this is actually the thing that I recommend. Yeah? That's the, the book. Das Leben im Wassertropfen. It's, uh, yeah. This is the old edition. Yeah? But uh, I, can, I can highly recommend. Yeah? Uh, is it possible to make home microscopy into a business not to get rich just a stream of additional income would that be a video or stills would you uh, would be a market for this university's youtube etc um you see uh, folks who need uh, to do microscopy um, um, commercially i mean universities and they have their own departments really yeah um, I don't know if uh, uh, what you, you have to fulfill a certain need if you want to make a business you know, with microscopy. Yeah? The question is, is what would that be or what could that be? Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting one. Um, uh, you see, um, you can try to earn a little bit of money with everything. Like, I don't know, maybe uh, selling slides, making slides uh, and then maybe selling them. That would be a possibility. Yeah? Interesting question. I'm thinking about this myself. Yeah. What's the best English identification? I don't know. I don't know, honestly. Um, uh, maybe um, I know that there are some online guides out there. And honestly, um, it depends a little bit on what level you want to identify the, object, uh, the, the specimens. It can get specific very quickly. Okay. Um, you, you can do the following. Maybe you can, I don't know. Um, there is, 
I'll quickly go on. Now, nah, um, there is a, um, uh, d d there are some uh, free books available as well, but I don't know if they're as, as comprehensive, okay? The author of the German book, yeah, this is, you know what, I'll, I'll just put it in here, okay? That's the, yeah, the, the book here. And uh, yeah, if you actually go uh, beneath the video, you actually see a link uh, to my Amazon affiliate shop. And if you go into the books there, then you can also, there's also a link to this, uh, to this book here. Okay. Again, this is the, this is the, the, the old, the old edition. Yeah. Yeah. It says there's more than 1,500 drawings. Yes. It, it's, it's a standard, it's a standard book. It I, I, actually, I, I really think it, it's so good, the book. Uh, that that uh, you should have one regardless of what language it is. And if you do, if you really want to read the descriptions, you can al always use Google Translate. You take your mobile phone, you take a picture of the page or the section, and it will automatically translate it for you. Okay. Um, so yes. So this is uh, the thing. I have no problems because I, I speak German. <laughs> so I'm I'm lucky here. But honestly, the descriptions are not even so important in here. It's the name um, of the organism. Yeah. Um, Thank you. How about the brand and type of the polarizing microscope? Do you have any recommendations? Can you recommend the best? Okay, if you want to go into polarization microscopy and if this polarization microscopy is supposed to be, um, I would say, more serious than just trying it out a little bit. I mean, you can convert any microscope to polarizing microscope by yourself for a few euros or dollars to polarizing filters. Put one beneath the specimen, slide on top, and another one on top of it. I actually used um, um, 3D polarizing glasses even, and you're able to, to do polarization microscopy. However, however, if you actually want to do, if you want to be really serious about uh, observing um, polished uh, cross sections of minerals or if you want to do, do um, uh, even measurements, then um, a, a proper dedicated polarizing microscope is actually a good idea. And this now takes me again back to the type of objectives that those microscopes have. Uh, so first of all, those microscopes have a rotating stage because the, the angle of the light. Uh, and those microscopes also use specific polarizing objectives. They're called stain strain free objectives strain as in tension because those standard um, cheap um, economical objectives are not strain free uh, this means that um, when you actually uh, look at polarized light the optics depolarize the light a little bit because there are certain tensions in the lenses and the, the, the and those objectives that are made for polarization work are made in such a way that the lenses, the optics, does not mess up the level of polarization or the direction of polarization. So, um, so now you were asking for for companies. If you want to, uh, these are specific microscopes. Okay, you cannot simply buy them, um, yeah, as cheaply. In this case, you should contact one of the larger microscope manufacturers: Olympus, Zeiss, Nikon, Leica, maybe even Euromax which uh, is also has pretty good microscopes um, and uh, because they are selling those to research for research. These are not uh, polarization microscopes are not microscopes that normally um, yeah, you would use um, in a hobbyist setting. Okay. Um, of others. Yep. Yes. Best identification is Cultrit and <laughs> I have to explain this because I've been doing this when I've uh, um, worked at the university. If you want, and this is a very um, um, uh, important point, there is uh, uh, Leo the Crafter um, in the comments has said, has said the following, the best identification is culturing the organism, growing the organism and doing a 16 SR DNA uh, sequencing. Okay, this basically means you have to do a DNA analysis. And uh, indeed, uh, this is also something that I have done when I um, identified and classified bacteria. My master's thesis was in bacteriology. You can do all sorts of chemical analyses. Um, microscopy is very limited in actually identifying some organisms all the way down to the species level. And what you have to do is you got to do a DNA analysis and then compare it to a database. Yeah. Okay, uh, the book is also available in Spanish. That's interesting. I did not know that. Okay, can a metallurgical microscope with a vertical illuminator 
uh, be adopted for polarizing light? Well, the thing is the metallurgical microscopes have uh, the light coming from top. But if you actually have, uh, and, and there is no hole in the stage for light to go through. But it's like this, that many microscopes out there or microscope companies out there, the microscopes are so modular that you can actually exchange the parts. So maybe it's for some microscope models, it's possible to convert one microscope into a different type. And then you have to talk to the company. Okay. So. Um, what are the advantages of phase contrast compared to oblique illumination? Okay, these are completely different systems. Um, and here again, uh, I want to explain this a little bit here. Um, phase contrast, I've got a phase contrast objective here. Okay, um, I just want to show you a, a very easy way to identify this. But first of all, it says here PL, I think it says PL, positive low. This is an old an old Olympus uh, objective, okay, I don't know, from the 1970s maybe. But if you look actually here on the side, and you, do you actually see the ring? There is a ring right on the, it's called the phase ring. And this is a very typical thing that phase contrast objectives have to have. It is semi, uh, it, uh, it's not completely black, but it allows only a little bit of the light to go through. And what phase contrast microscopy does is it is able to convert differences of refractive index into differences of brightness. Example, bacteria are generally quite difficult to see using regular bright field microscopy because bacteria are transparent. But with phase contrast microscopy, you're able to see bacteria black or dark on a bright background. So you're, it is called optical staining. So without the addition of any chemicals which might actually kill bacteria or whatever you look at, you're able to see differences um, in structure that you were normally would not normally not be able to see. Fritz Zernike, a Danish physicist, uh, won, won the Nobel Prize uh, for having developed phase contrast microscopy many years ago. Okay, oblique illumination um, works like this by using a filter, for example, like a phase uh, a dark field filter. You put it into the uh, complete bright field, no special optics. So it's oblique is quite easy to do. You put it in here again, it's too small here. And then what you do is, is you swing out the filter a little bit. Okay. So that the light only strikes the object from one side. And this gives the, it's called oblique illumination and gives the impression as if the object is illuminated from one side and gives a slightly three dimensional look. Um, so the appearance is quite different. Um, each system has its advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage with phase contrast beside cost is, is that especially thick specimens don't look very not good. You've got to have very thin specimens. So for example, the cheek cells look pretty nice. All the bacteria are made visible this way. But for thicker specimens, yeah, you're kind of losing color. So you see every contrasting technique has its own specimens where it's best to be used, okay? So you cannot say that generally one is better than the other, but all of those techniques allow for to have different advantages and disadvantages. Another interesting German book, The Große Kosmosbuch der Mikroskopie. I've got it, yes. It covers topics from mineral microscopy, preparing specimens, staining, yes. Yep. Um, I have to say one thing, um, honestly, um, there are, I think way more good German microscopy books uh, than English ones. And I don't know why this is the case. Maybe it has to do something that in Germany there is a strong microscopy tradition because of the optical companies like Zeiss and Leica and Leitz and so on. Um, maybe it has historical reasons, but honestly, uh, the yeah, and some of the books actually have been also been translated into English. Yeah, Have I observed slime molds? Not yet. I had trouble finding some. It seems they are uh, somewhat um, ignored in the semi-micro world. Yeah, that is an interesting one. Okay, uh, look, microorganisms identifying them with a microscope uh, up to the genus level even is something I wouldn't dare to do. Um, you, uh, you'd have to do biochemical analysis. Yeah, yeah. Um, are the online keys? Yes, there are, but um, they are relatively general, the online keys. So if um, you, it allows you to distinguish between worms and nematodes and, 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 and flatworms. So they are re relatively general, at least what I found so far. Okay. Yep. And there are another, there are a couple of books here. Yeah. 
So what is a mint? I don't know this myself now. Yeah, it is unfortunate that DSC is so expensive or we would see much more detail in unstained cells. But yes, DSC differential interference contrast microscopy DIC is quite expensive. Yeah. Yep, high school biochemistry is killing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what we are doing is the following. Let's, uh, yeah, so this I answered. So this was actually also an interesting uh, question. It uh, sounds a little bit very um, trivial, but actually there are several reasons. Um, why do objects sometimes move under the microscope? I just wanted to, to uh, tell you that one reason, of course, maybe some of the bacteria or ciliates, they move on their own. However, there has been a question, why is it all streaming? I was putting, I put something under the microscope and everything was flowing. And the reason is, is that this has to do with capillary action. So when that, what, what happens is the following, if you put a, um, let's put a little bit of, of, of a small droplet of water uh, on a microscope slide. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I don't even have to illustrate this. There is already a, yeah. Yeah, an onion cell over here. If I were to put now a little bit of water here on the side, what's going to happen is the following. You're going to see that the water, if there is too little water in there, it's going to be soaked in and this causes a streaming motion. And also when air bubbles burst or are expelled outwards, then this causes a streaming. And this causes movement under the microscope slide and um, this is an artifact, so to say. Uh, this basically means does not mean that the yeah this is because the way that the slide is prepared, and this can actually also be used. And this is what I just also wanted to tell you is uh, for um, if you, for example, want to include now a stain or for example some salt water, and you want to what you do is you uh, put a tissue paper on one side and you add yeah whatever you want to add on the other side, then you can deliberately increase uh, this this, um, this movement um, where you're able to pull in um, a stain or a certain liquid under the microscope slide using capillary action yeah so but this was actually a, 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 yeah one of the questions here is uh, why do um, yeah some of the yeah why is there sometimes movement in there actually the cells they don't move but actually they all move now well that is because of, of the movement um, on, of the water here okay um, Drift of optics and stage, but also of your cells becomes hell when doing live cell imaging. Yep, yep. So stage drift is is uh, when um, this can happen as well, um, and but this means that you have to readjust the tension. And is is when uh, you put uh, something on here, and then the slowly the stage starts to sink down. Okay, and this has to do something with the tension adjustment. You have to readjust the tension. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on here. Uh, actually, one of the things I wanted to talk about as well is, is the difference between Köhler and condenser diaphragm. And I can't believe this. I'm already talking an hour and I haven't even covered some of those questions. But I'm really happy that uh, so many of you are asking questions because it makes everything much easier. So what I would like to do now is, is I would like to illustrate uh, first uh, Köhler and, uh, and uh, condenser diaphragm. The condenser diaphragm I already talked about here. Adjust depth of field and contrast. Uh, many microscopes have those, but maybe not all of the microscopes have Köhler illumination. I just want to illustrate this here as well. Let me go over to the microscope view. Okay, I'm going to now show, put, put it all the way down here. Okay, and I'm going to turn on the light. Okay, so you see over here. Okay, what what happened now? Ah, I switched it off and not on. <laughs> okay, I really thought some, there's some problem with the electronics here. So that is, of course, the lamp. And look, there is another diaphragm here. Okay, that is curly illumination. Okay, and let me put it like this. And look what happens here when I open and close uh, the curly diaphragm. I'm able to reduce the, the so-called the field of view. And by doing that, I'm reducing... Uh, light reflections and for photography and video this can increase or does increase contrast for some specimens okay so this is Köhler down here okay and um, but the real thing that I wanted to show you is is the um, how it changes the light beam okay and you can do that by placing a piece of paper in here okay um, now the problem here is is that this is a little bit too bright now unfortunately 
Um, I don't know how I'm going to do this now. Uh, ah, yeah, here, here it's better. Okay. Um, look, uh, look uh, very carefully look, over here. Um, here's the arrow. Okay. Look at the angle of the light beam. And I'm now changing, I'm now changing the, the condenser diaphragm. Okay. So, so basically uh, this thing here. Okay. This here. And look what happens uh, to the angle um, of the light beam here. You see, it changes the angle. Okay. And this is, uh, re um, of course, it also reduces the light intensity. I get all that, but that's not the point. The point here is to him to adjust the the contrast and also the the resolution and the depth of field and look what happens when I now change the Köhler diaphragm. It's not as quite as easy to see, but what happens is you're changing the width, okay, of the light beam, okay. Especially down here, it's a little bit overexposed. It's now much wider, so the angle is the same, but the width changes, okay. And this allows me to actually limit the, so what I do is when I want to take a picture is, is I open it up uh, to the extent that I'm just barely able to see the edges of the diaphragm and uh, therefore I'm reducing stray light and uh, this makes uh, sure that only uh, the necessary parts that are actually looked at are illuminated and there's less light bouncing around in the, photo, uh, in the optical system and this uh, for some specimen so can increase the contrast. Yeah? So it's, it's good for photography. Okay, um, so I bought a 1975 uh, correct Tokyo microscope and I noticed that if I completely close the condenser aperture, I can see that the right side is darker. I guess that the condenser is not aligned. That is correct. Um, yes, um, and some microscopes actually have the possibility to align uh, th these systems. Um, maybe I can demonstrate this. Uh, I'm now closing all of the condenser. Look, I can also align. There are two knobs which allow me yeah, to align, see, uh, everything. Yeah? Um, and uh, some microscopes um, allow for easier alignment than for others. Okay, okay I, I, I guess you get the idea. Yeah, um, yeah greetings, uh, yeah, there's someone from Australia, okay. Um, so is there a set of stains that one could buy? Are any considered dangerous? Uh, yeah, stains, gen look, stains generally, um, one has to be careful because stains are designed to react with biological uh, uh, biological molecules. And uh, uh, yeah, so, and there are stains that you can buy, but uh, recently it has become very difficult uh, to buy them because Amazon does not ship them uh, chemicals uh, anymore quite as easily as they used to. Okay, so if you want to buy stains, you have to contact directly a chemical supplies company and sometimes they don't sell to private people. So what I, um, however, think is a stain that's easily obtainable is methylene blue um, because it is also used not only in microscopy, but it's also used, for example, people who have a home aquarium, they use methylene blue to treat fish of certain fungi. Okay, it's actually used as a medicine. Um, for for fish diseases, okay. So a certain substances you might be able to get um, as well, or you can try to experiment with uh, with certain inks because they contain certain chemicals as well, okay. So that is a little bit the 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 thing, uh, the uh, a little bit uh, yeah. Um, I would say that um, staining is not always necessary, yeah? so. Um, it's in, not nice to experiment around with it, but you can see a lot of things uh, yeah, directly from, from nature. Yeah? Okay, um, many are considered dangerous goods. Yes, yes, exactly. Yep. Are LED lamps better than filament bulbs to reduce chromatica fringing both in optical observation and camera work? Um, I would say uh, not necessarily for fringing. Fringing is this chromatic aberration, but LEDs do have other advantages uh, for camera work. And one of the main advantages is, um, is that uh, the color temperature stays the same regardless of what light intensity you choose. Um, so um, yeah, if you, you use a halogens, halogen bulbs, then um, you have the problem, if you see this as a problem, that the color temperature changes, okay? Um, that's a little bit uh, the, the main issue. Also, halogen bulbs are hotter because they have more infrared. 
and this can uh, um, increase the evaporation of the water. So especially for time-lapse photography, it might be an issue. Yeah, yeah Amscope has staining kits, so you might directly contact them. Uh, but I know that if, uh, if it's sold over Amazon, it might be a problem. Yeah. What's my favorite microbe? <laughs> Difficult to say. <laughs> um, honestly, I have had some difficult finding Lacrimaria, which is a, a protozoan which has a very uh, long neck. Um, but I think that's a very fun one. Uh, I found a few of them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, otherwise, I like to uh, I like to look at uh, I like to look at all all of the things. <laughs> yeah. By the way, again, uh, going back, if you if you're using if you use okay, you know what. One of the reasons why one of the reasons of why Köhler illumination was invented is is because it started. Uh, I said it uh, reduces it reduces um, uh, stray light. That's correct. But Köhler illumination also uh, makes a very even illumination because um, before the invention of LEDs, uh, the problem is is that you had. Um, in, in, in a picture, the central part where the filament of the light bulb was was brighter than the border. So they had very uneven illumination. That's why uh, Köhler invented this system um, to make sure that it's an even illumination as well. I, I'm saying this because, um, um, in, yeah, because uh, in addition to, to the question about LEDs and, and, um, yeah, and the filament. Okay. Um, is it very bad not to use another line? No. Honestly, uh, this has actually been a complaint with some of the microscopes that were bought new. Um, yeah, some of those uh, Chinese-made brands, they were shipped and the condenser was not aligned. Uh, honestly, I did not see a big issue. A not aligned condenser is a major problem for phase contrast. Okay, I'm just saying. For phase contrast work, the condenser must be precisely aligned because the phase contrast condenser and the ring the phase ring, which I showed you before here, okay, in there, um, it must be perfectly aligned. And uh, yeah, remember this this phase ring? There's this uh, ring that you see in here, yeah? And if this is not aligned, you're not even gonna get any picture. And, and for this reason, alignment for phase contrast is absolutely essential, yeah? So, but for bright field, I, yeah, generally, it's, I think not such a big issue, okay? Huh. Uh, what else? Uh, this, this is also another one. I know it's a little bit off topic, but um, it relates to a fundamental question. This is people want to are interested in, in, in blood under the microscope. Yeah, I also put blood under the microscope several times and they say, okay, now is blood before or after vaccination different? Um, and um, this is a, I think there are expectations in microscopy now that microscopy is not able to meet. No, you're not able to see the difference um, under uh, the microscope here because uh, the, the, how the immune system responds to something is uh, on a chemical level where the antibodies are produced and this cannot be resolved uh, with a microscope. Um, just wanted to clarify this uh, because these are so many questions about um, uh, about vaccination and vaccinated blood before and after corona vaccinations and what are the differences. There are certain things that you cannot see with a microscope. And um, yeah, I just want to clarify this because the shape of the red blood cells or the white blood cells is not determined by, by a vaccination. Okay, so this I just am saying that there are limits to what microscopy is able to do. And some people actually have hope that microscopy is able to even answer these questions, but it's, it's not. Okay, so that's uh, simply something I just wanted to, to clarify. Um, yeah, um, this is I talked about. There's some some buying advice here. This was actually one that also is quite interesting. Um, why do cells look transparent under the microscope, but not when many of them are together? So in other words, it was a very concrete uh, question. Is if you look at an onion here, um, why is it that the onion cells look transparent, but not the onion? Okay, um, so this is an interesting one. And uh, this also relates a little bit to the optics here. The reason um, is maybe there's several reasons. Of course, color might be one thing, but actually it's not really colored, right? Um, a little bit the following, why is it that even though air is transparent and ice is transparent, why is it that the mixture of ice and air, snow is not transparent? You cannot look through snow. Same for clouds. Yeah, air and water, both are transparent. 
you cannot look through clouds. And the reason is again is, is that because there are um, is a, of a differences of refractive index. And when you have a an onion, I just prepare for example like this one over here. Yeah, if you want, we can look at it under the microscope so that we also look at something under the microscope today because we haven't been looking at anything really today under the microscope. Okay, um, if you look, and I have to focus this somehow. Am I able to find it? Okay. If you look at this, uh, you're able to see well that the cells are pretty transparent. And uh, you have to use now microscope optics, like, I don't know, dark field or phase contrast or what in DIC, like in my case, uh, to make the structures visible. But generally light is able to go through, otherwise you're not able to see anything. And the thing is, is because the, the cells are simply too thin to absorb or to refract so much light that you're not able to look through it. But if you've got many of them on top of each other, then um, you're not able to look through anymore. Okay, everything's going to be darker. So if I take a thick piece of, of onion, okay, I don't know, yeah, this one over here, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's a millimeter thick, yeah, and if I were to put this under the microscope, let's have a look, okay, I'm not even bothering to put a, a yeah, <laughs> a cover glass on top, and this is what we see, yeah? yeah, you see everything is much darker, much blurrier, and we're not able to see through so much. And the reason is, is because the individual cells uh, start to cover each other up. And if I make it yet thicker, it's going to be completely black. Mm, okay. So this is uh, actually, um, yeah, uh, one of the, the reasons if objects that are very thin, um, yeah, are not able to interfere with the light quite as much um, as thicker objects. Okay. Well, there are lots of questions again. Um, could one set up a filter such as a millipore filter or even a coffee filter to concentrate microorganisms for viewing? And that's an interesting one. I would imagine using gravity only to avoid damage to the microbes' comments. Okay, concentrating microbes, uh, the answer is yes. Um, the, there are, it depends on the size of microbes. What you use is for collecting microbes, get yourself a plankton net. You can buy them online. They're called plankton nets. And they are very fine nets. And what you do is, is you do not, you basically pull them through a pond, through water. And the pore size is so small that, uh, so may, maybe not bacteria, but uh, larger cells, ciliates, and so on, are caught in that plankton net. And then you can collect it for microscopy. So, yes, this actually does exist. Okay. Um, if you want to do, you, uh, yeah, with those millipore filters, I think they're even smaller. Um, they are used for filtering out bacteria. Um, but for casual observation, you, you, you get yourself a so-called a plankton net. It's a little bit like, <laughs> it reminds me, you may be a little bit like, like those nets that you go for catching insects, right? Um, but it's much, much finer, okay? Um, so uh, gravity to avoid damage to the microbes. What you can do, um, it depends on the microorganisms. Uh, microorganisms that move, like for example ciliates, um, they will move towards the surface of the water because th that's where you find oxygen. If you have certain algae, um, sometimes what they will do is they will sink to the ground. Some of the algae are also able to move. They will move towards light. But yes, you can use sedimentation and you can actually wait until they sink down. Some of them will actually move up. Or you can use a centrifuge um, and spin and centrifuge at a low speed also works. I've also done this. Okay. So this is also a way that you can concentrate microorganisms. I have a high uh, as red platelet count under my compound. Honestly, um, yeah, I would not do any form of self-diagnosis and whether something is high or low depends also, um, you have to standardize all of the procedures and you have to actually count them. Yeah. Um, is there a lead uh, light brand? Can you suggest most lead bulbs are not centered like a tungsten bulb? Um, <clears throat> honestly, if you want to use a, an LED for a microscope, then you really have to look carefully whether the LED actually is able to, to fit in into the microscope. So sometimes um, yeah, it's not simply a bulb, but a, a small little plate that you have to mount. So that's number one. Number two, sometimes uh, there are several light bulbs and you have to have some kind of a diffusion filter over it. Like, like, like this light bulb over here. I don't know, one to five, there are five LEDs in here. But there is a yeah, white diffusion filter over it, okay, to kind of even out everything. So I would say it's not really a brand question. It's more really a question of um, 
Are you able to fit the LED into the microscope? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> bacteria filter staining. Yep. Yeah. Uh, compost or worm castings have masses of microbes swipe. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Interesting to look at. Onion cells. Um, five o'clock. Yeah. Okay, Oliver, I have learned so much from your videos. You're very generous to share your knowledge. Thank, thank you um, also to you. <clears throat> it's now, wow, one hour and 14 minutes. So I, I'm also starting to lose my voice a little bit. Uh, is the glass of slides and cover glasses different of window glass or glass bottles? Um, good question. I think, um, I think, hmm. okay, I'm, I'm gonna hypothesize now. Um, when you collect the place that we when when i have empty glass bottles at the place in many countries of the world world they collect glass bottles and uh, they specifically say no window glass can be thrown or should be thrown into the recycling containers for glass bottles so i assume that there is a difference in, in those okay um i don't know now about the the yeah uh, about the glass of microscope slides, but I can imagine uh, that maybe they're using the cheapest way of producing them. And because there are production techniques uh, for window glasses, um, I guess maybe the same production technique is used and maybe also the same type of glass. I'm hypothesizing now, okay? So, um, but I think it probably must be different from glass bottles because uh, the recycling process uh, um, is, is different, but that's a guess from my side. Okay, well, I tell you, there are still, a f I'm actually happy that I was not able to answer all of the questions I prepared here uh, because uh, then I have uh, still some questions um, yeah, left over um, for next time. Okay, um, yeah, and, uh, but this one actually, look, this one actually is uh, something that maybe uh, because it kind of ties in a little bit. Um, testing water because this is actually one of the things is, is okay when I want to do some microscopy of lakes and, and so on um, I live uh, way up in the Arctic Circle a small island it's frozen eight months a year locals prefer to get the water from frozen lakes instead of the reservoir and purifier and I'm very keen to test the ice that they collect for drinking water the problem is it's kind of a cultural faux pas in my opinion to go and look to see if the water if the drink is contaminated honestly um, I think that uh, time has already proven that if people drink from the water and they're all fine then everything's going to be fine um, otherwise there are actually official um, agencies and institutions responsible for uh, for testing the drinking water quality okay um, on the other hand um, again i'm not quite sure well if microscopes actually are able to help out here a lot um, because uh, if uh, water is contaminated then maybe it can also be contaminated with heavy metals or other contaminants which are not microorganisms and uh, they are also a problem um, generally what i would say is that what you have to try to avoid is you have to try to avoid to get wastewater sewage water into it, it, mixed with drinking water but then the, even the concentration might be too low that you're able to directly observe it and then you have to filter it. And then if you're able to find bacteria, it's still not a guarantee or you don't know which type are they. Yeah? You So basically microscopy is probably not going to help you here. Okay, You'd have to do a proper test um, of the water quality. Yeah, So uh, just, uh, just saying. Um, how can you sustain a water with a healthy number of microbes? There are some plant material. Is there something I can feed? Okay, I will go through the last questions here very quickly and then um, I have to uh, stop. If you're asking uh, the bomb that's uh, yeah, <laughs> commenting here, how can you sustain a sample of healthy number of microbes? Um, there's some plant material. Well, honestly, this is what people who have a home aquarium are concerned about. This is they have to establish a healthy microorganism count. And um, what is a healthy one? Um, as soon as you have decomposing material in it, you have um, an explosion of bacteria uh, there. Make sure that oxygen concentration remains high. Make sure also that there is no direct sunlight because this uh, causes an overheating um, and also, an, and, yeah, and this drives out the oxygen. So my suggestion is, is uh, keep the water replenished. Um, do not overfeed. Um, organic material should be in there, put in a leaf and um, it will decompose. Yeah. Um, 
the question answers, yeah, what are you stay? What are you staining? Well, I'm, I'm not staining a lot. I like to most uh, ob mostly observe the, the organisms directly. Um, but when I use a stain, I usually use methylene blue. And sometimes for some demonstrations, I use iodine to stain starch. But be careful with iodine. Be very careful because it's corrosive and you do not want to get it in contact with your microscope. Okay. Yeah, some people find it very useful. Okay. Um, streaking the colony forming units to see a views and do microscopy of the bacterial colon colonies. And this is something that you can do. I do not recommend it because you end up growing bacteria that you do not know what they are and you actually need some training um, you know, and some safety training here. I mean, some folks in, on YouTube I've seen, they were growing their bacteria from their own thumbprints and fingerprints. You're, man, you're growing staphylococci. I mean, I don't want to mess around with those guys, uh, with those bacteria, honestly. Um, yeah, especially because they're able to grow on the human skin. So be careful with, uh, yeah, uh, with growing your own bacteria. All the troves like cyanobacteria need oxygen and light only. Well, carbon dioxide, not oxygen, carbon dioxide and light only. Okay. So um, refractory glass, crystal and window glass have different melting temperatures than the packaging glass. Okay. Thank you. Interesting comment. Okay. Unknown bacteria automatically. Uh, yeah. Biosafety level two, especially when from human origin. Yes. I confirm. I confirm. Um, I worked with unknown bacteria. We had uh, regulatory uh, laboratory checks. Yeah. And uh, for biosafety level two of unknown bacteria, um, you, know, you have to be an, actually an authorized lab. Yeah. And for this reason, I do not recommend um, that you actually grow bacteria on agar plates, especially unknown ones, and they are unknown. Um, the only bacteria that I approve of that you're growing is uh, if you make your own yogurt at home, okay? Because then you're not working with unknown bacteria, but you're working with known bacteria which are edible. You can eat them and you can buy bacterial cultures online um, to make your own yogurt, or you can actually use fresh yogurt yourself and then put it into new milk and then you can make your own yogurt. People have or kefir, um, it's a fungus and bacteria. So there are safe microorganisms around. Okay, I would not uh, play around or uh, grow unknown um, organisms, microorganisms from human origin. Okay, E. coli K12 also safe. You got to get it from from somewhere. Yeah. Uh, e. coli K12 is a standard laboratory bacterium, uh, which uh, is used in, also in genetic engineering a lot. You know what it is, and uh, it's uh, yeah not dangerous. Okay, um, yeah, we don't need another COVID, please. <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, I would say uh, it's enough for today. Um, I want to thank you again for for uh, for all of those questions. There are every time I do a session like this, there are more and more questions. I really li like this. I was kind of worried that I, there are not enough questions. That's why I prepared so many of those here. Uh, but having a little chat uh, about microscopy is also quite nice, even if I did not show you so many specimens today under the microscope. Okay, hope you enjoyed it. In, uh, yeah. In any case, I wish you all the best. A happy microbe hunting as always. And I guess I'll be around again uh, next week here uh, at the same time. Yeah. Bye bye and see you around.